Now a certain man is sick, Lazarus of Bethany, in the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So they sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. The sickness is not in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Let us go into Judea again. But Rabbi, the Jews were just seeking to stone you. You're going there again. And not twelve hours in a day. If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because of the light of this world is in him. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but our ghost and I may wake him up. Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Lazarus is dead. I'm glad for your sake that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. See how he loved him? Could not this man who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from also dying? Did I not say that if you believe you'll see the glory of God? Many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done believed in him. Once, 
wonders his ancestors told us about. Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of the Midianites. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength that you have and save Israel out of the Midianites' hands. I am not sending you. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But how can I save Israel? My claim is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, But how can I save Israel? Gideon replied, Now if I have favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it's really you talking to me. Please do not go away until I bring my offering to you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside and prepared a young goat, and an ephah of bread from wheat. Without, with, uh, he prepared an unleavened bread. When he returned, Gideon said to the, to the angel, the angel of the Lord said to Gideon, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth onto it. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat with the un and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flamed from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the, and the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands on Orpha of the Eversites. Have you ever felt the way Gideon felt when he was chosen by God to lead, his, lead the Israelite army? How can I do this, he asked, he wonders. This is going to be hard. Can anyone relate? However, as we read, we see Gideon ask the Lord, Please show me that this is from you. And when God did, and God did, when things seem impossible, we must go to God and look for answers, but always be willing and moving forward. <laughs> so what is the definition of impossible? The definition of impossible is something that is not ever occurred that would exist or be done. We will continue reading in Judges 7, starting with verses 1 through 8. It'll, it'll, it will be on the screen. So starting in verse 1. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all of his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of the Midianites was north of them in the valley of the hill of Moriah. The Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men. I cannot deliver the Midianites into your hands, or Israel will boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there are still too many men. Take them down to the water, and I will thin them out there for you. If I say, this one shall go, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water. There, and the Lord, there the Lord told him, Separate those who lap water with their tongues as dogs from those who kneel down to drink. So three hundred of them drank from cupped hands, lapping like dogs. All the rest got down on their knees to drink. The Lord said to Gideon, With the three hundred men that lapped, I will save you and, save, and give the Midianites in your hands. Let all others go home. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites home, but kept the three hundred. Who took over the provisions and the trumpets of the others? Now the camp of the Midianites lay below him in the valley. In verse 2, it says, God said, The people who are with you are too many. This was a great test of Gideon's faith. His army of 32,000 was already outmatched by 135,000 Midianites. So what seemed impossible before now really seemed impossible. Gideon was probably thinking that only a few hundred would leave when God said, Tell them if they are afraid to go home. He was not expecting 22,000. And then again, when God said that the men are still too many, he figured that God probably wanted five to 3,000 men left, not 300. When Gideon 
had only God to trust, because there was only one Israelite soldier to every 400 Midianite soldiers, that made their chance a less than 1% chance of survival. Just like Pastor Mark's Detroit Lions have less than a 1% chance of beating the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> Can we relate to Gideon? Think about some, something breaking in your home, whether it be a washer, dryer, refrigerator, or the roof needs fixed, or try, and try and figure out how to pay for it. Or that test coming up in school on a subject that you're not very good at. Getting bad news from a doctor. It could be any number of things. However, we must trust in God and, be, and trust in God to handle it. Are you prayed up? Are you in God's word? Doing the impossible can only be achieved through the strength and wisdom of God. Let us continue reading in Judges 7, verses 15 through 22. This is when the impossible achieve, is achieved with God's help. Starting with verse 15. When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he bowed down and worshipped. As he returned to the camp of the Israelites and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp in your hands. <coughs> Dividing the three hundred men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them, with torches inside. Watch me, he told them. Follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do as exactly as I do. And when I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, then from all around the camp, blow yours and shout, for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon and the men, the hundred men with him, reached the edge of the camp at the beginning of the middle watch, just after they had changed the guard. They blew their trumpets and broke the jars that were in their hands. And hold, and they blew their trumpets and broke the jars in their hands. The three companies blew their trumpets and smashed the jars, grasping the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in the right. And they shouted, A sword for the Lord, and a sword for Gideon. While each man held his position around the camp, all the Midianites ran, crying, out as they fled. When the three hundred trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Beth Shittite toward Zahara, as far as the border of Elbel Mahel, near Tabitha. Now verse 15 when God shows Gideon the exact plan of how they will defeat the Midianite army, he gives him exact details on how to place the men, where to place them at, and what to give them. So, these details were vital to the success of the battle, and if one company had disobeyed Gideon and God, I figured that they all would have been killed. But as we see in verse 20 through 22, the plan is carried out, and they successfully defeated the Midianites. This group would not have been able to defeat the 135,000 men without God. And in John 15b, it says that apart from God, you can do nothing. Also, in Jeremiah 29, 11, for, God, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. In Romans 8, 31, it says, What then shall we say in response to these things? If God gives us gift, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Do you see a pattern? God has a plan for, for us. He has our back. However, we must be willing to follow and do as he tells us. We must have determination to go and move forward for God. Because we cannot succeed any other way, we have to believe and give it everything we've got, but we will fail. But if we give everything we've got to God, we can do great things just like Brock did from facing the giants in this video clip. So, coach, how strong is Westview this year? So, coach, how strong is Westview this year? A lot stronger than we are.
go to the 30? I think you go to the 50. The 50? I can go to the 50 if nobody's on my back. I think you can go with Jeremy on your back, but even if you can, you promise me you're going to do your best. All right. Your best. <laughs> okay. You're going to give me your best. I'm going to give you my best.
this scene in that movie. Brock thinks it's an impossible task to take <coughs> and death crawl from one end zone to the other. And his coach asks him to give him his best. And he blindfolds him. So that way he does give him his best. Sometimes God blindly leads us into something, but we have to give him his best, our best. We can't just half do it. So, Christ is always saying, give me your best, not half best, all of it. So don't quit, keep going, and just hang in there, because God's right there with you. I don't think we can relate to Gideon, and even Brock. My prayer is that this message has got you thinking. God has a plan for each of us. No matter how difficult it seems, no matter how impossible the task, we can be victorious through Christ. It takes belief, faith, and trust to know that God has the best for us in our lives. Remember what Jesus said in Scripture. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible with God. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for letting us be here. Help, help Taylor. She delivers her sermon here and be with her service and for everything to go okay. And just never pray. Amen. Amen.
faith in Christ, we can unlock the door and have that relationship with God. I want us to look at the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they showed what black faith looks like. And to give you a little bit of background, King Nebuchadnezzar built a statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide. And when anybody hears the sound of the horn, the, the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all other kinds of music, they have to fall down and worship the statue. If anyone refused, they were thrown into a burning furnace. If you have your Bibles with you, I would like you to turn to Daniel chapter 3, starting at verse 12. And if you don't have your Bibles with you, it will be on the screen behind you. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship in the golden image that I have set up? Now if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigen, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made. Well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden images that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste. He declared to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, The truth, O king, he answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of their fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came, and came near to the door of the burning fiery furnace and declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. And as you read further along, you will find out that once they are all out of the fire, not even one hair on any of their bodies is singed. They are all still the same as before they were thrown into the fire. This just shows that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are willing to stand up for what they believe in, no matter what the consequences may be. Even though they know that if they don't bow down to the statue, they will be thrown into the place of furnace. They are willing to put their faith and trust in Christ and know that he is going to take care of everything. So put yourselves in their shoes for a minute. I bet you're scared or even terrified of what you're about to do. Even though you may have second thoughts about doing it, you keep saying to yourself, this is the right thing to do. I have to do this. God wants me to do this. In my opinion, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are three very great people in the Bible because they put all their faith and trust in God. And looking at the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ask yourselves, do I put my faith and trust in God? Do I stand up for God like they do? In order to do this, all you have to do is try. As Christians, 
that's one thing you need to do, is try. As long as we try to stand up for God, try and put our faith in Him, try and trust Him, and try and tell others about Him, we're doing our part. We are trying. If we try and fail, at least we did something. And one thing that I really like is it's better to try and fail than to never know and always wonder. To me, this means it's better to try and fail than not do anything at all and always wonder if you would have ever failed or succeeded. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who succeeded in standing up for God, because of their faith, it shows us that we can never fail if God is behind what we are doing. So don't be afraid to trust God to bring you through what he needs you to do. Think about Jesus, who also succeeded in many miracles that he performed. True, he was God in human form, but he still had faith in the Father. And one miracle that stands out to me that he succeeded in was raising Lazarus from the dead. And just like in the skit that you saw earlier, Jesus was told that one of his best friends was very sick and that he may die. Instead of leaving right away, Jesus stayed where he was for two more days. And after those two days, Jesus and his disciples headed back to Judea. Now some of you are probably thinking, why didn't Jesus head back right away? That is because Jesus had a plan. And it was going to bring glory to God. If Jesus would, would have went back as soon as he heard the news, he would have killed him from being sick, not raised him from the dead. And when Jesus arrives, both Mary and Martha tell him, if only you had been here, Lazarus would still be alive. See, they could have easily blamed Jesus for Lazarus' death. And think about it. Were they disappointed? Yes, I'm sure they were. And I think that is why they were telling Jesus, if only you had been here. But with the faith that Mary and Martha have, they know that they will see him again one day, the resurrection day. But what they don't know is Jesus is going to bring Lazarus back. When Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, many people are amazed at what he did. They are probably thinking, how is it possible? How did Jesus do this? Jesus showed that faith in God and trusting in him is what raised Lazarus from the dead. Jesus was truly the Son of God. And in this story, people doubt Jesus even though they have faith. In a way, this is like some Christians of today. We doubt God sometimes. But just because, just because we doubt God, it doesn't mean that we don't have faith. It just means we don't have as much faith that God wants us to have. When we doubt, it doesn't mean we don't trust God. I just think it means we have a hard time seeing how God is going to handle something. But you know what? That's not what we need to worry about. Because God is going to take care of it. And our job is not to tell God how to do things. Just because it may seem impossible, it doesn't mean that it is impossible. Luke chapter 18, verse 27 tells us, Jesus replied, What is impossible with man is possible with God. And now that we have seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the people of the story of Lazarus and their faith, let's take a look at us in our faith. Is our faith as strong and trusting as theirs, or are you in between? <coughs> By this I mean, you know that God is there, but are just having a hard time following through with it. Take this for example. In basketball, when you're about to take any shot, whether it be a free throw, a three-pointer, or any other, you have to follow through with it. You can't just throw the ball and expect it to go in every single time. You have to have some sort of form and follow through with the shot. Now you can also not be taking a leap of faith at all. No matter which one you may be, you can always improve. No matter what the situation is, you can always take a leap of faith. And earlier we looked at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, but as you read further on through verses 2 through 4, it goes a little further. So starting back at verse 1, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 through 4 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the angels were commanded for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed in God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. I think this verse is saying that even though we can't see God, it doesn't mean he's 
not there. And as we have seen today, that no matter what we may be going through, or whatever trial you may be facing, we need to stand up for God. If we have faith in Him, and just let Him do His work in our lives, we will see that He will make great things happen. Me personally, I struggled with this for a very long time. When my papa died, it felt like I lost the only father figure that I had, because my dad wasn't ever really around. He was there, but he wasn't really the father figure that I needed. My papa was that. He was my best friend and my hero. And when he died, it felt like that piece of me was missing. I really struggled with this during this time because my father wasn't around and I was heartbroken. But one thing that I know for sure though was that with the help of some very special friends and family, I was able to realize that God is my father and that no matter what male figure I may have in my life or may not have, God is going to be there. And from then on, God has been my rock and my father that I look up to and tell everything to. We just have to have faith and trust that he is out there and that we, are going through, that we aren't going through anything just because. And after all that we have talked about today, I want you guys to ask yourselves just one question. Am I taking a leap of faith? Whether it's a leap of faith and standing up for God, or even just have faith that you're going to make it through the next day or any struggle that you may be going through. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, he replied, because you have so little faith, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as the mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And all this is saying is that if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can take a leap of faith and know that God is going to take care of you. If you know that God is going to take care of your relationship with Him, it's going to make you stronger and you won't have as hard of a time in taking a leap of faith. Just remember, God is there and that He will take care of you, but you have to do your part and take a leap. All we need is some faith, trust, but maybe not the fix the best. Let's pray. Dear God, I just thank you for this day and just ask that you reach out to some of these people and just help them take a leap of faith in what they're about to do, and whether it be daily or monthly.